Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, lay in repose at the court today, giving members of the public a chance to pay their respects. The former justice died earlier this month at the age of 93. The court has changed substantially since O'Connor joined the bench more than 40 years ago, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor, one of the four women currently serving, paid tribute to her predecessor's barrier-breaking role. For the four of us, and for so many others of every background and aspiration, Sandra was a living example that women could take on any challenge, could more than hold their own in spaces dominated by men, and could do so with grace. While the number of women on the court today is perhaps most notable, John Yang looks at the many other ways the legal profession has and has not changed in O'Connor's lifetime. When Sandra Day O'Connor applied for a job at a big law firm after graduating near the top of her Stanford Law School class, a firm offered her employment as a secretary. While that was 70 years ago, surveys and studies show that progress for women at big firms is slow, especially in the top ranks. A 2022 survey found that only 25% of law firm partners are women, and women make up 37% of all practicing attorneys. What's been accomplished since 1981 when O'Connor shattered the glass ceiling, becoming the first woman on the Supreme Court, and how much still needs to be done? Laura Zagar is managing partner at the San Francisco office of the law firm Perkins Coie. Laura, I know that in your office in San Francisco uh, that a majority of the partners are women, but that is the exception rather than the rule. How would you assess where the legal profession is now in terms of gender disparity? Generally, the industry, we're, we're falling far short of where we should be. Just to put it into perspective, I graduated with a nearly balanced class in 2002 uh, at UCLA School of Law. And I'm, we're still in an industry where, as you cited the statistics, you know, we're still far below 50% in the partnership ranks at the top law firms throughout the country. We are definitely an anomaly. We have 62% women partners in our office, but that's twice as much as the average, you know, throughout our peer firms and, and, and within our firm and other offices. So we still have a far ways to go, but translating, we get 50% of our incoming attorneys are women, but we're not translating that into getting them into the partnership ranks and into the leadership ranks. What are the obstacles that women face in big law firms? I think there are the ones that everyone expects, which are, you know, getting through, um, getting through to the promotion, getting the, you know, a lot of the time people focus on, you know, women being the primary caretakers for children being an obstacle. And that's certainly one of them. But we're also seeing the same trends with women that do not have children. So it, it shows that there's more going on than might meet the eye. I think there are problems that we just know through science that people do. They, they tend to bring up and are attracted to working with people that are like them. So sometimes the people who get the best opportunities are the men, not necessarily the, the women, regardless if they have children or not. So um, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of layers and, and, and dynamics into this situation. And it's important for firm leaders to look at that full dynamic um, to make sure that we get parity at the leadership end of the spectrum. And what are you doing at your office of, of Perkins Coie that other offices could emulate uh, and, and try to achieve the same sort of results you are? I think most firms are approaching this as a recruitment issue at the junior ranks. And so I think they think if we recruit 50% women, eventually that will happen at the partnership ranks. But what's happening is they're getting through all of the hurdles to get to partnership we see women self-selecting out, often to go to in-house roles um, or to, to leave the legal profession altogether because they don't see a future for themselves. What we've done here in San Francisco at Perkins Coie is focus on the recruitment, retention, and success of our women partners. And what we've seen is that's important to have our junior associates come in see role models, see success, and realize that they too can be promoted and be successful. So I think the legal profession's focus needs to stop being on recruitment of the most junior attorneys and promoting the success and opportunities of the women already in the partnership and focus and target their lateral recruitment on partner successful women partners 
because we need the role models for these women who are coming up through the ranks, that there is indeed a future for them in this profession. Talk about role models. To what extent was, was Justice O'Connor a role model when she became the first woman? And now we have, of course, we've since had uh, Justice Ginsburg, Sotomayor, Kagan, Barrett, and now Jackson. What's the effect of, of having women at the top level uh, of this profession? I still remember, I won't say how old I was, I was <laughs> quite young, but I still remember Justice O'Connor being confirmed. I mean, it was one of the first moments in my life that I thought I could do this, like I could be an attorney, I could be a judge, instead of thinking I could be, you know, one of the careers that women, you know, were expected to go into, nursing, teaching, et cetera. And, and by no means do I think that is, those are, I come from a long line of nurses and teachers, but it's important that we have our brain power and our capabilities across all professions, including law. So Justice O'Connor really was the first moment in my life that I thought, wow, I could do this. And seeing Justice Ginsburg come in and say things like, then we could have nine women on the Supreme Court, or just mind blowing. And so I think it's just so critical to not just see the judges on the Supreme Court become increasingly women, but judges across all benches, you know, the rest of the federal bench, and then on state courts as well. So my first experience in law was actually interning for a woman trial court uh, judge in Ohio, you know, and I, I, I learned a lot from there and it seemed achievable because she was able to do it. So the role model and, and Justice O'Connor's contribution to, to women in this profession is, is, you know, can't be quantified. Laura Zagar of the law firm per Perkins Coie, thank you very much. Thank you.